So I guess the next logical step to demonstrate to you guys is actually going to be with the release aid and how we actually are going to execute the shot using the methods which we've talked about earlier on. Sort of the engagement of the shot. Because in theory, you know, we've got the scapula loaded, we've got the front arm strong yet dynamic, but we've still got to engage, we've still got to approach the release aid to make the shot fire. Definitely. And I think it's important to note at this point that when we're making the shot fire, this is certainly not a conscious decision on our part. I mean, I'm going to talk through the trigger release operation to begin with. And for me, I'm going to pull back and I'm going to load up that scapula. And as I do that, I like to lay my thumb just onto the barrel of the trigger and feel the weight of the trigger underneath my thumb. And then I start to move that scapula back gently. In doing that, it sets the release aid off and executes the shot. So pretty much the last conscious thing you do is the act of consciously laying your thumb on there and aware of where your thumb on there and about how much tension you have in the release hand. Yeah, it's very important for me to keep my, my thumb relaxed and make sure, as I say, just absorbs the trigger. It's very important that you don't mentally decide to make the decision to set this off at any point. It must be that scapular motion which just tightens up the release in your hand, setting the trigger off. And that's how I execute the shot with the thumb button release. I've always looked at it with the thumb release as I have three separate components. I have the bow, I have the release aid, and I have the human body. And when I take that release aid and clip it onto the bow, the release aid now, in theory, really is part of the bow. And I'm trying to load or to pull my body against the bow to make it fire. I think it'd be a good opportunity now if I uh, grab my bow and um, I'll make some shots and maybe you can just talk them through Absolutely. exactly what's going on with the shot. Some other things to take note of, as Liam draws, he drops down low to engage the scapula, maintaining strength in the front arm towards the target, adding a little bit of strength as needed during the shot. Liam then begins to engage the release aid with his thumb. This is the last conscious effort Liam has in the shot. The rest of it now is carried out automatically and the subconscious will continue to load the scapula until the shot fires. <laughs> Having now thoroughly covered how we activate or engage the thumb style trigger release aid, we're now going to take some time to discuss the activation of the hinge style release aid. Now an important thing to note here is that the actual execution of the shot is going to use that exact same scapular motion that we've talked about right the way through this. However, you're going to see that the engagement of this is actually a little bit different. We're going to see Dave's fingers rotate back more, a little bit more movement than what we had in the thumb button style, right? That's correct. That engagement, that movement has to be there because this release aid is a hinge release aid. And there in the premises of it, it has to actually hinge before it'll fire. So I do have to actually consciously begin the hinging, begin the movement, the engagement to make that fire. One thing to note with this uh, hinge style release is that you haven't actually got to make that conscious decision to lay the thumb onto the trigger like we had with the thumb button release. And for some people at home, you might find that actually easier to get this execution that we're talking about, right? Yeah, I think a lot of people get apprehensive about the relationship between the thumb and the engagement of the trigger. And some people get a little too heavy on it. Some people also get tentative of it and afraid of it and will start to freeze up or, or stop the shot. That's why, like Liam mentioned, for a lot of people, especially in the experimental and learning stages of this form, a hinge style release aid or a resistance style release aid may be better suited for them because they don't actually have to think about w setting their thumb on the actual item that executes or activates the release aid. They can just draw back, load up the back, make sure the front is good and strong, and begin that hinging movement to make the release aid fire. Okay, so let's take this down the range now, Dave, and uh, have a look at the engagement and execution of the shot with the hinge style release. Let's do it. Okay, so an important thing to note here as Dave gets ready to pull the bow back, we're going to notice that his vertical body position, upper body position, grip, and release hand grip are exactly completely identical to what we've talked about, even though this is a different style of release. So as Dave pulls back now, we can see that he engages his scapula in exactly the same way, loads up, but in order to consciously start to make the shot process, we can see his release fingers actually twist back on the release aid in order to execute. So, now that we've got our shooting form dialed in, it's important to talk about the next step, and this is aiming. 
Now I'm gonna figure this is the section with the most myths and strange and all sorts of crazy ideas about it. We're here to blow the lid clean off that and dispel all the rumors and show you exactly what it is that me and Dave do to keep our dots steady in the center. Yeah, what we're gonna do in this segment is we're gonna go where most of our professional colleagues in the archery world won't want us to go, but we're gonna go there and share it with you. We're gonna really define aiming, and I guess the best place to start with that is have everyone watch and ask themselves what aiming is. And nine times out of 10, what is it they come up with, Liam? I mean, from the experience I've had, everybody seems to think aiming is quite simply putting your dot in the center of the target and holding it there as still as possible. And that's, that's, that's not our take on it, right? Yeah, and a lot of people seem to put the emphasis on hold and aim way in the list of priorities long before the actual shot or the execution, don't they? Most definitely. And I think the way that we both look at aiming is aiming is quite, it's quite simply looking. I mean, if you can imagine, I've got a dot on the wall up here. And if I want to aim my finger at that dot, I simply stare at it and I can bring my finger to it. And that's perfectly easy for me to do. However, with aiming a bow, most people would not do that. They'd simply go up a bit, across a bit, down a bit, right a bit, left a bit, and that makes, makes it life very difficult. So we're trying to get across the fact in this chapter that aiming is quite simply looking. Yeah, that's all it is. Aiming is looking, it's your eye aligning objects, your eye sending messages to your brain, which then relays messages to parts of your body to correct what it sees out there uh, based upon a pre-formulated picture that you've put together in your head before you start the process. But the biggest thing about aiming is people tend to let it govern and control everything they do with their shot. And it simply, that simply has to stop for you to excel to an elite level. Aiming most definitely needs to be a subconscious process, not something that's consciously in the forefront of your mind. You need to learn how to do it and let your brain take over and do it for you. Other important factors to consider when aiming is scope size, field of view, peep size, dot size, and the amount of magnification you have. Yeah, all these uh, factors are going to attribute to the way that the, well, the way the target actually appears to you when you're trying to aim and begin this subconscious aim. And you know, for, for me personally, it's been very much a, a trial and error process, and just you know, looking and seeing what other people use in order to get the picture which I need best, you know, to, to recreate what aims best for me. And uh, I use actually a relatively small size peep, but then I like to keep the scope uh, as far away really from the bow as possible uh, that my extension bar will allow. I'm actually using a, um, a 0.7 diopter lens at the moment, which I think creates around um, a, a, a seven times magnification. For me, I'm actually, um, I prefer a little bit bigger peep actually, because the peep size and scope size have to kind of match up together. And that's one of the key fundamentals of alignment and aiming. And I mentioned it before, but I want to reiterate it here, is that your scope housing is able to be seen incomplete so that your scope and peep line up together like two circles. I think that's definitely essential with the beginning of it. Um, so my peep tends to be perhaps a little bit larger than yours, but I am shooting a scope that's a little bit bigger housing and field of view. Yeah, I find I can, when I look through my peep site, I can literally just see the rim of the scope. So and like a halo me, around it. That works better. That also gives me the most clarity in my lens because I do like quite a clear picture to aim with. Yeah, I find if I go really small, I get the clarity, but I lose the light. And I think in a lot of places, having that light is more important than the clarity for sure. In terms of dot size also, I mean, basically the, the bigger your dot is, the less it will appear to move, am I right? Well, yeah, that's true, but however, the more target it covers, and a lot of people do have problems with, you know, they see the target, they put their spot on the target, it covers more than they're comfortable with seeing, so they end up playing kind of a peekaboo game and checking and see if it's still there. So I think dot size is definitely something that's very personal preference but we've got a method in which we look at the target that might be a little bit different than everybody else's. Yeah, and uh, one thing I would say is if you go for a dot size which is too big for you and it actually uh, obscures too much of the target, it's a common problem that if you need to aim off for windy conditions or any other adverse conditions, the big dot is very imp imprecise and inaccurate. Yeah? It can be when you're trying to aim off in, in windy conditions at long distance. It can, you know, too big a dot can cover too much of a color band 
and can be definitely a little difficult. But I think if you can get your dot size down so that you're looking at the target a little bit differently, I think, than anybody else does, a lot of people say you want your dot to, you know, to be as small and as precise as possible. But the smaller you get the dot, what happens? Well, the more it moves and yeah. makes your life more difficult. But the way that we aim with this subconscious aim, for me, I like a, a relatively small dot, but not for outdoor archery, but, but not too small. Whereas indoors, I feel that without the adverse weather conditions and, you know, it's um, my dot tends to hold a little stiller indoors. I like to go for the bigger one. And this gives me the appearance of it holding very still, which when you've got to make that super X in the center of the target, it can be very difficult. Yeah. Tell me about it. I kind of in my sight picture indoors, 18 meters, what I'm looking to do is to have just a halo of yellow all the way around my dot. Now myself, I shoot a black dot. You might like orange, green, red, however color is irrelevant. Something that's appealing and pleasing to your eye. But I think if you can turn things on the flip side a little bit and look at them differently and start to look at what's around your dot rather than what's behind your dot, I think you'll start holding steadier almost immediately. I guess the other option, which we've actually got to dots in our scope lens, is um, the ring, the opportunity maybe to have um, a, you know, a circle around with um, a hollow center so you can actually see exactly what it is that you're, you're aiming at. Um, for me personally, I'm not really a big fan of the, the rings. I find that a lot of the time when the, the target faces get torn up, it tends to almost drag the ring off to one side, you know, into the hole that's being created. And, and also, I, I think I like to have the object which I'm shooting at actually covered in the halo effect, which you described earlier, Dave, is exactly what I look for in my sight. And for me, that makes a much more comfortable aiming picture. I found for me in my own personal experience and professional experience, the circle or hoop, as you want to call it, causes more problems for me than it fixes. As Liam mentioned, the holes in the target, the target gets shot out in an area that's not in the center. The way that your eye likes to align objects, your eye's going to be drawn to that. It's going to send messages to your brain and to your body. It's going to move the bow and center that shot out or that shadowy spot in your circle or in your hoop. And another thing to consider too with the circle that's very difficult in my opinion is aiming off in windy conditions and once again at long distance. You know, if your circle may be correct for one distance, you know, say at 30, 50 meters, you go out at 70 and 90, that thing could be, you know, it could almost be as big as the bale. And then the adverse is true. If you get it small enough so it works good at the long distance for you, it could be entirely too big at the short ones or too small. Definitely. And I don't know, Dave, have you ever seen those guys that are in the middle of the feet or at the change of distance, <laughs> they're pulling the extension <laughs> bar in and out? Well, that's <laughs> yeah, in and out of they've got a whole pocket full of lenses and peeps and apertures. And I think, you know, simplicity. Exactly. That's something I don't want to go through as a professional and you shouldn't have to go through it as an amateur recreational archer is having to have all this extra gear, having to make all these changes for all these different distances. It's just simply not needed. It's really, and, and this uh, reiterates, it's really important to have a very simple sight picture yeah. with the halo, which is what I mean, I mean you both look for, you know, in the shop. Yeah, I think simplicity rings throughout our, our philosophy, our form, our setup our equipment selection and, and the maintenance of it. We, I really like to preach simplicity. Keep things as basic as possible so that when something does go wrong, you can recognize it and fix it really fast before it causes you too much damage. Hopefully we've dispelled a lot of the myths about aiming, but most importantly, when aiming, you've got to have a sight on your bow, which you can depend on. That's why myself and Dave both choose the Shorelock Supreme. Across the Sherlock line of products, they've got something for everyone, regardless of your ability level. Whether you're a bow hunter, weekend archer, recreational archer, junior archer, or top level professionals like Liam and I. This particular model, which we choose, is the Supreme. And it's, I'd say it's the quintessential site for the compound archer. It's got both first, second, and third axis adjustment. It's also got very fine up and down movement and left and right movement. Yeah, Sherlock was actually a pioneer in the third level of axis adjustments for their time. I was actually uh, took a, a very big part uh, in helping Steve Gibbs when he was developing a third axis leveling technology for the Sherlock brand over 10 years ago. I believe third axis adjustment is, is now essential to the modern day compound archer. Uh, myself and Dave are both um, multi functional, you know, in the types of archer that we do, both indoors, outdoors, and field. 
for field archery especially, if you don't have that third axis adjustment absolutely perfectly, the chances of hitting the same target at a degree of 45 degrees up at an angle of 45 degrees down is going to be almost impossible. Yeah, whenever I do seminars or clinics or anytime I actually break out my Sherlock third axis leveling tool, it pretty much puts on a full on leveling seminar. People see you adjusting yours, they want to have theirs looked at and it just leads to one after the other. And you'd be surprised the number of people out there shooting field archery and 3D archery events that their sights are not completely level on all three axes and that's costing them accuracy. That's just another great example of why Sherlock is such a, you know, a great brand to represent because accessories and components such as the third axis leveling device, the massive variety of colors, the different shapes and sizes available is really great for us as shooters. And first and foremost too, above that is durability. Durability and precision, quite simply as professionals, our entire livelihood depends on this site being reliable and not moving from where we set it. Most definitely. The versatility, the durability, and the reliability is very important when you're choosing a site, and that's why we choose Sherlock.